Chapter 13, Gravitation. Every particle in the universe attracts every other particle in the universe with a gravitational force given in box one. This is known as Newton's Law of Universal Gravitation. Box two is a famous constant. It's called the gravitational constant and it's approximately 6.674 times 10 to the minus 11th newtons meters squared per kilogram squared. Gravity is the weakest of the fundamental forces, but yet it's strong enough to lift the oceans off the crust of the earth and able to rip a hole in the fabric of space-time. Box three, shell theorem. This is useful right now and it's also useful in the study of electrostatics. Box four, this is our first inverse square law. This is a really good visual. It shows that if you double the distance from a source, the intensity of that source falls to one quarter. If you triple the distance from a source, the intensity falls to one ninth. Box five, superposition. We've taken this approach before. It basically says if you have three or more objects, you analyze them as pairs and you sum them together. Box six shows you where G comes from. We've always used G equals 9.8 meters per second squared, but now we know where it really comes from. You can see the gravitational force you feel on the surface of a planet depends on the planet's mass and size. Box number seven gives three really interesting facts about the Earth. Its density isn't uniform, it's not a perfect sphere, and it rotates, which means if you stand on a scale on the equator, your weight is less. This lower left box shows some interesting data. If we assume the Earth was a perfect sphere, the gravitational constant would be 9.83 meters per second squared. You can see one way to lose weight is to climb to the top of Mount Everest or take a really high flying balloon or even better get yourself into a low earth orbit on some space shuttle or international space station. As mentioned your weight on the equator is less than anywhere else. Here we apply the force analysis method and see that the g value on the equator is 0.034 meters per second squared less than 9.8 meters per second squared. Now we're going to derive a general expression for gravitational potential energy. We've been using UG equals MGY, but that only works on or near the Earth's surface. Here's our scenario. We have two bowling balls, bowling ball A and bowling ball B. We analyze what happens when bowling ball B is moved from a position R away from bowling ball A to some position infinitely far away from bowling ball A. Here's our convention the gravitational potential energy of two objects separated by an infinite distance is defined as zero. This seems like a strange convention. Zero is the greatest amount of gravitational potential energy possible. Two objects that are separated by a distance less than infinity will have some negative value for their gravitational potential energy. Box three, we remember the general relationship between change in potential energy and work. We're getting very specific. We're talking about how the change in gravitational potential energy is related to the work done by the gravitational force. The expression for this gravitational force is shown in box four. Study the heck out of boxes five through nine. Understanding every detail of this derivation is going to give you some really important insight and make you a better problem solver. Box number nine shows the expression for the gravitational potential energy that exists between two objects located a distance r apart. Here are some key takeaways. Gravitational potential energy is always less than zero. It's always a negative number, except for the extreme case when the two objects are located infinitely far apart. As both bowling ball B moves further away from bowling ball A, the gravitational potential energy increases, meaning it gets less negative. Binding energy refers to some external agent that supplies the energy needed to keep the constituent objects infinitely far apart from each other. So for example, to separate bowling ball A and bowling ball B by an infinite distance, some external agent, me for example, needs to separate those bowling balls, otherwise they would naturally come towards each other. Total system potential energy is another superposition type of approach. If I have three objects, I have three potential energy terms. If I have four objects, I would have four gravitational potential energy terms and so on. Time to talk about escape velocity. 
Lifting an object up off the Earth's surface into deep space requires a ton of energy, especially during the liftoff phase. Say this black dot represents a satellite. It's sitting on the surface of the Earth and is launched with enough kinetic energy to propel it to a point infinitely far away from the Earth. So in a perfect scenario, the kinetic energy I invest at energy state A is completely transformed into gravitational potential energy energy at state B, which is located at an infinite distance from the Earth. Normally an object is launched from the surface of the Earth and some kind of rocket engine continues to invest energy. Without these rockets, you'd have to give it a much greater amount of kinetic energy at launch, which is exorbitantly expensive. There are a growing number of alternative launch methods that are gaining interest. For example, a space elevator. Box number one, we're just applying the energy analysis method. Study it carefully, and there's a pretty well-known expression for the escape velocity. Next section, planets and satellites, Kepler's laws. This is Kepler's first law, which says all planetary orbits are ellipses with the sun at one focus. Here's Kepler's second law, which says a line segment joining a planet and the sun sweeps out equal areas during equal intervals of time. It basically says each of these pie slices you see are the same size, even though they have different shapes. This is, in essence, conservation of angular momentum. Johannes Kepler is definitely in the Hall of Fame as far as astronomy is concerned. He was one of the first to take a whole bunch of observational data and apply math and science to interpret it. Kepler's first law, also known as the Law of Orbits, states that all planets move in elliptical orbits with the Sun at one focus. And I should point out that this refers to any satellite, not just a planet orbiting the Sun. Sun or the Moon orbiting the Earth. Study all of these boxes very carefully. Each one of them is going to provide a really helpful reminder and reinforcement of key underlying concepts, specifically torque, angular momentum, and cross product. Box number nine is saying a line segment joining a planet and the sun sweeps out equal areas during equal intervals of time, which may not sound too significant to you right now, but turns out to be hugely significant. This was one of the first breakthroughs into figuring out out how stuff moves around in the sky. Time to derive Kepler's third law, also known as the law of periods. This law basically says if you know the distance between a satellite and its central object, say for example the distance between the Earth and the Sun, you can figure out how long it takes that satellite to orbit its central object. Conversely, if you measure how long it takes a satellite to orbit its central object, you can figure out the distance between that satellite and its central object. Going through this derivation will really enforce Newton's law of universal gravitation as well as centripetal force concepts. Box number eight shows Kepler's third law. This is the form we'll most commonly use in this class. Box number nine accounts for planet mass, something we typically ignore. Once again, this derivation really does a great job reinforcing Newton's law of universal gravitation and centripetal force. Kepler's laws really do represent a mild milestone in astronomy. Now we turn our attention to energy analysis. You'll see in this derivation we combine conservation of energy along with Newton's second law, Newton's law of universal gravitation, kinetic and potential energy expressions to derive the energy associated with satellites orbiting a central object. Box 6 shows the translational kinetic energy of a satellite in a circular orbit. Box 7 shows the total mechanical energy of a satellite in orbit. Box 8 just restates 6 and 7. Box 9 is a copy and paste of the total energy associated with an orbiting satellite, but it replaces R with A. A refers to the average orbit size when the orbit itself is an ellipse rather than a circle. 